says that God buries our sins into the deepest ocean. The problem is we go deep sea fishing. And we, we tend to kind of dig them up, you know, and sometimes we live in guilt. Listen, um, what is the devil? He is the accuser of the brethren. Right? He accuses you day and night before the Father, and he accuses you to you too. And so you just have to answer him back, and you just say, I have been justified. I am declared innocent before God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So, hey, we have a church picnic after church, don't we? Amen. So we're all looking forward to that. So you'll just kind of grab your salads and whatever and just head over to Greenwood Park. And we're going to have a lot of fun there. We're going to see horseshoes flying everywhere and going to have a really fun barbecue. So it's all good. I hope to see you all there right after church. Uh, the other thing going on is uh, senior lunch this Friday. You don't want to miss that. Whether you're senior or not, you just come. 12 o'clock, right out here, this coming Friday. So uh, I, think, I think that's about it. So praise God. Let's continue to worship God with our song. Amen. You're singing beautiful this morning, church. I'm going to invite you to stand. Let's sing some more.
is no one like you. None who can compare to you, God. There is no one better than you, Lord. No one better than you. You satisfy everything, Lord God. All the emptiness that is within us, God. You satisfy the longing of our souls. You, you satisfy our thirst, God. You satisfy our hunger. God, there is no one like you. There is none who can compare to you. We love you so much, God, because you first loved us. And you demonstrate, you show us that love every moment, every day of our lives. We give you thanks, God.
And all the church says, Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Well, we're going to see a, a clip here, or a video. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> Sorry. Feeding Those That Feed Us is a, a ministry that began in 2002 uh, by the California Southern Baptist Convention. These are migrants, people that uh, work the fields under the sun, 115 degrees. And so it's an opportunity for churches to do something locally uh, with missions, uh, feed and clothe the poorest of the poorest in our whole country. The results of feeding those that feed us, evangelistically speaking, have been 30,000 decisions for Christ. Because of the pandemic, feeding those that feed us came to a screeching halt. We weren't able to do everything that we have done in the past. I was, of course, discouraged and overwhelmed, and I said, oh, no, we're not going to be able to do anything. Pastors and churches stepped forward, even in the pandemic. They said, Oscar, we would like to be able to minister to the people in the field and in the orchards, and we want to take burritos, we want to take food to them, and then we're going to present the gospel. That just encouraged me, that just strengthened my faith. People just read it. Really, Jesus said, look at the fields, it's really to be harvested. And this pandemic prepared the heart of people to become Christians. We had a packing house call us and ask us if we would be able to be a part. Here we were able to use virtual BBS to go to the, the workers' homes. Mary um, got the idea from another church that was doing Sunday school virtually. And she came to me and said, you know, we need to keep these kids connected. Because we weren't able to go into the camps, we took that model and applied it to the migrant ministry. And you're thinking about that. How, what can we do to make their life better right now and give them some hope? And just giving, knowing that we could give hope to these children and bring a little bit of joy, that's pretty awesome. The Lord was able to do something great through the pandemic in helping churches to see the opportunity to re-engage in their local setting. We wouldn't be able to provide this ministry if it wasn't for the California missions offerings. Without the California mission offerings, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, it's been an amazing help that we don't have the resources at the church to help the, uh, to do this ministry. And I thank the Lord that Southern Baptists have participated here in the state of California by giving of their money, by giving of their time, by coming and volunteering in this great mission field here in California. And if you see these envelopes, CMO, that's what it means. California Mission Offering. We're collecting this through the end of this month. 35 million uh, people in California don't know Jesus Christ. This is a mission field. We go all over the world, across the oceans. But right here in our home state, we have lost people. We have people that need Jesus. And through this offering, if you would give beyond your tithe offerings here at the church, this is a special offering that we take every year for our state, the state of California. And I thank the Lord that I'm able to work with 2,300, 400 churches in California because our church allows me to do that. And also California Southern Baptist Convention allows me to pastor here at Annadale. And so I'm blessed to be a pastor and blessed to, to serve 2,400 churches in California. So um, this is great. I, you know, every week I look forward to giving uh, my, my part here uh, for missions. And uh, we want to bless someone here this morning. Uh, who brought one friend? Okay. Okay. I see somebody's hand over here. Sister, go ahead. What is your friend's name? Ashton. Ashton. Okay. Uh, welcome. All right. Let's give her a... a 
Okay. Okay. Anybody else bring a friend? Okay. Then I don't have to uh, get, get another. Uh, would you come up here, sister? No. Uh, yes, Amanda. For sister Amanda. Well, actually. And um, we, we were, you could share this with your friend, okay? <laughs> Let's give her, a, it's a little gift card. Yeah. And don't forget the pastor, okay? <laughs> I'm always trying to, you know, get an opportunity, but um, we're to be friends, amen? I'm going to talk about our best friend. Who's our best friend? Jesus is our best friend. I want to talk about friendship. If you have ever, if you ever uh, have been in the situation where you've gone to look for a church, sometimes you might leave your area, go find a church, or for some reason you're moving to another church. What, do you, what kind of a church are you looking for? What kind of a church? Some people, um, well, there's different things that people look for, for churches. Myself, my, my personal preference is, how do they preach the Word of God? How do they handle the Word of God? Are they committed to this book? That's my personal preference. And so, you know, that's, that's what I look for. And, and uh, when we were in that situation in 205, uh, the convention called me to, to serve with them. I left the other church in Fresno, and um, I was uh, church hunting. And uh, my wife went and... We looked at uh, various churches, and then Pastor Ernie invited me to here to Annadale, and my wife and I came, and, uh, you know, as my wife and I were talking, uh, uh, you know, I said, what did you think of Annadale? And she says, I like the church. I like the church. And you know why, what she said, why she liked Annadale? is because of the friendliness here at the church, because of the friendliness and, you know, as I said, people have different preferences. Some people have preferences of uh, programs. You know, this church has a good youth program, a good uh, young adults program, and a good adults program. And so some people try to find a church according to the programs that are there. Some, some look uh, for churches that have an awe-inspiring worship. They go, oh, man, that's a... That's a tremendous uh, worship leader, tremendous worship group, and I'm going to become a member of this church because of the worship in that church. Okay. Others, uh, because of the buildings. Okay. <laughs> Believe it or not, some individuals, you know, I like these modern buildings. I like this state-of-the-art, uh, you know, facilities. And believe it or not, some people make their decisions based on the buildings. So we're not going to argue or, or fight over what, what is the best preference. I'm going to give you something that perhaps all of us could be united under uh, a priority uh, of a church. And it is what? Friendliness. I think most people would agree about, you know... Uh, that And as a pastor, I'm willing to admit that many churches throughout the many years that I've been a pastor have joined because of my preach. No, not my preaching, okay. Because of, uh, you know, because of the friendliness. I've had people that have joined the church just because we've invited them to go to a picnic. How many people that I've known personally that we took them to a picnic, we were laughing, having a good time, and I want to join your church. I had one brother that visited the church in Fresno uh, in the morning, and uh, I was having a barbecue at my house, and I invited this individual. I said, why don't you come this afternoon to my house? We're having a barbecue. And he said, okay. And I had hot dogs, and he brought steaks, you know, which was good. <laughs> anyway, but uh, after, after, with, when we were there in the barbecue and everything, this individual said, you know what, Pastor, the Lord has led me to tell you that I want to join the church. 
you know. So one of the uh, preferences that we can all rally around together is that we, is, is friendliness, becoming a friendly church. And if I were to ask you, what are the marks of a true friend? They have money. No, I don't know. <laughs> you know, what is a, you know, what, what are some of the marks of a true friend? A person who's there, as Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend love it, loves at all times. A brother, you know, is born of adversity. You know, and, and you could tell when you have good friends because when you have money, they're there, right? But when you don't have any money, you look around and say, who's still sticking around, right? Or who's there when I'm going through the hard times? Usually that's a great indicator that that person is a good friend, right? When you're having struggles in your life and they give you a call or they're there to serve you, minister to you, that's a good friend. That's a good friend. A, friend is, a good friend is also a person who uh, doesn't, will, will not necessarily tell you what you want to hear, but sometimes will tell you the truth. Amen? I mean, if you want your friends to tell you the truth. You know, a good friend will tell you a tr the truth in a loving way, in a, a very special way. They know how to tell you, hey, I don't know if this is right for you or I don't know if this is helping you. You might want to think about not having so much alcohol or you, you know, be careful with your money, you know, because you, you, you might get into some things that later on you're going to... See, a friend is someone that could tell you those things and, you know, you might look at them like that, but later on you go, man, I'm glad that my friend told me that, you know, I'm glad that they told me that. So, what, what is a friend? What is a friend? And I'm glad that the Lord gives us the... The answer to that here in his word because this book tells us the truth and we can go here to John chapter 15 and, and the whole context involves verse 12 to verse 17. The, the key verse there is 13 for today but I'm going to start with verse 12 here. I want you to look at what it says here in the New American Standard Bible and he says this okay how do we relate to one another how do we how do we be how can we be good friends with Christ and also with one another. You might want to jot some things down here. And it says that this is my commandment. What? A, he's commanding us. What? That you love one another. What is a commandment? A commandment is not uh, something that I can, you know, uh, options or, or that I can pick and choose if I want to do it. A commandment means what? Do it. If I love Jesus and if he is the Lord of my life, then I will listen to his commands. I will obey him. And he says here, this is my commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you. You know, and I, I want to say here that my wife should be my friend. Amen? You better say amen, husband. <laughs> you get the... Right, you're... I should, because the Lord sometimes has to remind me, hey, your wife is your friend, remember? If not, then you know what? My wife's going to go look for a friend, and I might not like it later on, or I might do that. That's why your wife, your spouse, your, your significant other should be your friend. And the Lord begins with that command and then he ends with it in verse 17 and he says here just as I have loved you love others greater love has no one than this that a person will lay down his life for his friend my friend Jesus when did he lay down his life for me at the cross at the cross he sacrificed himself for us he shed his blood for us he gave his what? His all. If you have a friend that's willing to give his all for you, would you continue being that person's friends? By all means. And then verse 14, you are my friends. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You know what? If you're not saved, even though the Bible says that Jesus was a friend of sinners, but if you really want to become his 
real good friends, you have to get saved. You have to become a Christian. Because his best friends or his friends that are his friends through salvation are the ones that the Lord gets very intimate with them. And people that aren't saved and people that don't know Jesus don't have that intimacy, that closeness with Jesus like those of us who are uh, believers. It's not because we're so good. No. We recognized our need and said, Lord Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. I know I'm not worthy. I know I don't deserve it. But here's my life. I receive you. And he comes and he becomes my Savior and my Lord and my friend. And then it says here, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Why did he have to say that? Obedience. When I obey the Lord in my life. No longer do I call you slaves. For the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I call you friends. Because all things that I have, I have heard from my father and I have made known to you. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit and that your fruit may remain so that whatever you ask of the father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you that you love one another. He begins with that command and he finishes that command. So here he is telling us what? Exactly as he tell. First of all, he's telling us that that uh, friendship should be what a priority. Make it a priority in your life. Some of these individuals that have written books on uh, finding friends and keeping friends, like Carnegie, that classic book that was written many years ago. You can Google it, and he shows you how to make friends and how to keep friends. Very good. Let's learn from these authors. But here the Lord tells us that make friendship a priority. First with the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because He gave His life for me. He loves me. And Jesus, what focuses His attention, His priority in what? In being a friend to me. For the Lord Jesus, the love is a priority. Love for Oscar. Love for us here. It, it's a priority for the Lord. That word agape, I'm saying it in the Greek. You know, the Greek word, not just because uh, I'm Hispanic and I have an accent, but it actually does, it's pronounced e, agape. Agape, you heard that. Uh, that is uh, to love someone unconditionally, just to love them for who they are. We really should love our spouses that way. Not based on performance. If you make me meals, if you do the, the house, you, if you do the laundry, I'm going to love you. If you don't, I'm going to... No, 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 it's not based on performance. I should love my wife with an unconditional... Just love her. It's not, let's see if you could perform for me. Let's see what you do for... No, no, no. I love, I love her totally, completely, and fully. And she should uh, love me that way also. And that's what true love is. But it's a priority. The Lord says friendship is a priority. Friendship is a priority. And you know what? When friendships are a priority in our church, our church is going to what? It's going to go forward. It's going to advance. If we don't have friendships here in the church, and you know what? It's hard to be a pastor. You know why? Because sometimes pastors live lonely lives. Why? And some, some pastors do it intentionally. Other pastors don't. But it just happens that uh, you don't have too many friends in church. Why? Because sometimes people don't want to be around you because they think you're going to judge them or you're going to, um, you know, size them up and, and judge them and... And I can't be myself around the pastor. You know that. And well, you know what? I think we should be friends. I would love some of these young people. See the young people here in our church? I would love them to go out there in our church to hang out. Not this week, okay? <laughs> Why not? Why can't some of the young people or young adults go out to my house and hang out? 
Why can't they fe feel comfortable being who they are around the pastor or pastor or leaders in the church, the deacon? I love going over the pastor's house. Why? Because I could be my, myself. And, and the pastor and his wife just, they're so friendly and they just love me. I, I, I wish, you know, uh, that that would be true. And it, you know what it's going to take me to invite them over. And they might not come just because I invite them, but if I have burgers and hot dogs and, you know, swimming pool and everything, maybe they will come. But my intention is to become their friends. We can become friends here. You know, if we want to fill the church, let's make it a friendly church. To such a degree that people go, man, I love that church. You know why? Because it's so friendly. People are friendly there. It just c comes out of people. Uh, you go to some churches, and, and uh, I got recognized in a big church of 1,500, 1, and everybody stood up, and, and they applauded for me and my wife. I remember one time. Wow. But right after the service, we stood in the back where you exit and not one person shook our hands. <laughs> Everybody cla clapped for us, but when they went out the door, there we were standing right there as they were going out the two doors there in this big auditorium and, and not one person was said, hey, there's Oscar and his wife. You know, we just recognized them and and uh, we're going to go over and just say hello to them. And so, one of the first observations here in these verses that I see is that Jesus focuses uh, his attention on the priority of what? Of, of loving others, of, uh, you know, expressing my love towards others. It was uh, important to the Lord and he commands us to do that. And if we would be friends to others... We wouldn't need to bring a great preacher or a great event to fill this place. People would come naturally because everybody in the church would be so friendly with them. What kills uh, people assimilating into the church are cliques in the church. By a clique, I mean that when we have fellowships, you go and sit there at the table with your family or with your uh, friends from the church. That's a clique. I can't, I can't sit with my family. It's fine, but once in a while, go sit with someone that's new. Amen? Wow. <laughs> think about it. Why do you think I'm out there going from table to table? You're the pastor, and that's what we pay you for. No, <laughs> you don't pay me just to be friendly or to... to you, pay, you know, I, I, I'm here serving God, and you're learning from my example. I heard an amen back there. but <laughs> And what about the second observation here? Jesus commands us to love one another. Him. Of course. And, and the Lord towards us. He loves us unconditionally. He just loves us, loves us. Lo you know, and He's not saying that He approves of, of my sin or my faults or, you know, and, and David was what? A great sinner, but he was a, also a great repenter. Remember that. We forget. Oh, he committed adultery. He, he, he was a murderer. You know, yes. But man, when he repented in Psalm 51, he had a contrite heart. He had a, a rep, he was, rep, he really repented. He meant business. Some of us are wallowing in sin. You know what I'm saying? Wallow, you know, and uh, no, 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 and we feel so comfortable in sin. No, it should bother us. It, we, something we should flee from because we want to honor who? Our friend. We want to honor, we want to please Jesus. Don't you ever get convicted when you do something wrong or sin? And, you know, you say, oh man, I wonder what my wife's going to say. I wonder what... <laughs> the first one that should come to your mind is your friend Jesus. Because he loves us. But we should also love one another. I'm glad that uh, we have some new people in our congregation. And one of, one of them is uh, Oscar. He's got a good name, Oscar, right? And uh, 
in the Spanish service. And Oscar feels so comfortable that he got back there in the, in, in the sound booth over there with Brother Omar and his daughter. But when, you know, when I walked into the sanctuary, I saw him sitting up there. I go, hey, brother, how you doing? <laughs> and, and I, you know, he, he was already, what, serving. He was serving. And now he's going to serve uh, Wednesday night by teaching the, the Bible study in Spanish. And he's going to play some songs. I go, I didn't know you know how to play the guitar. He goes, well, I just, you know, play a few but he's already serving. He goes, anything else you need, Pastor? You know, when was the last time I heard, <laughs> you need anything, Pastor? When was the last, you know, ah, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's beautiful to see people who, are, who voted for him. Who gave him that authority? I'll tell you who, Jesus. Ephesians 2 says that we are uh, saved by what? By grace through faith in Jesus. And then people don't read Verses 9 and 10, where 10 says, the Lord saved us to become what? To serve Him. Hey, there's an idea. <laughs> he saved me to serve Him. Wow. That's why I'm saved. You don't need a title to, to serve God. Like one individual told me many years ago, 20, you know, I was visiting a church and he told me, you know what, Pastor, I would serve in this church. He told me over here on the side, if only the pastor and church would give me the title of deacon. I didn't say this to him, but I said, in my mind, I said, I'm glad they didn't, you know, give you that title. <laughs> Why? Because if you're going to be named a leader or a deacon, you should be serving already. We don't pick people and give them a title to serve. We, we pick people who are serving and give them a ministry. Read chapter 6 of, of Acts. The church was looking for deacons and they, and, and they, and they found seven who were already what? Spirit-filled and serving God. Amen? And that's what we need here. The Lord says, love one another. Love one, one another. And I love the fact that some of you are serving others and, and ministering to others and when you hear of somebody in our church that is sick, send them a letter, a little card. Visit them if, you, if, if you're able to do that, if they're able to. Uh, something, take some soup to them. I don't know what, but do something for others. Serve others. That's what friendship is. Is it a core value in our church? I know we say that, that here at Annadale, Jesus is Lord and and you will feel what welcome but when is uh, friendship going to be a core value here in our church it should be something important for Annadale and we show it and demonstrate it what through our efforts serving others I heard this story about Dr. Robertson McQuilkin you know who was he in 1980 he was the president of Columbia Bible College and Seminary in South Carolina. Okay, a very important position, college and seminary. And it turned out that in, in the 80s, in those years, his wife, the doctor found out that, told his wife and, and him that she had a disease, you know. And you know what that disease was? Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, a crippling disease, a devastating disease. Uh, I've, we've had in, in our family uh, Alzheimer's. And Dr. McClickland prayed and he said that the Lord led him to turn in his resignation as president of the college and the seminary. And for what reason? To minister to his wife. He said, my wife has served me now in our marriage for 42 years. And now when she is in this situation, she says, I want to be able to serve her the remaining years that the Lord will give her. 
And, and he did that. You know, and people were saying, are you, are you crazy? You got this position. You have th this great task, this important thing for the Lord. And, and now you're going to go and serve your wife? And he said, yes. What a testimony. How many of us uh, husbands would do that for our wives? No. You know, I don't have time. I'll put her in a, in a home. I'll put her over here. I'm not saying you're going to do that. But isn't this a tremendous example? What is this here? This is a selfless serving. If you want to be a good friend to Jesus, serve Him selflessly. Serve the Lord with all your heart. Serve, them, serve Him willingly. Look how the Lord served the disciples when He uh, washed their what? Feet. <laughs> okay. In those days, the roads were what? Mud, dirt, dusty. And when He went and took that towel and He took you know, that water in, in a basin and went from disciple to... He said, sit down here. I'm going to, I'm going to what? Uh, wash your feet. That was delegated or given to what? The servants or slaves uh, to do that kind of work. But he humbled himself and said, I'm going to serve you. Their grimy feet, their dirty feet, their smelly feet, when what have you, he was willing what? To serve them. And how many of us are willing to serve? I'm not telling you to do that in our day and time. But what is the washing of the feet now in our day and time? How many of us are sacrificing for others? How many of us are paying the cost for others? Hey, that would be a good idea. This is what Jesus is talking about here. He demonstrated His love through selfless sacrifice. Selfish sacrifice. Are you a servant? Are you a slave? Actually, that's the correct Greek word. We've used servant, but the, great, the correct Greek word for doulos is what? Slave. I think I like servant better. Well, doulos is the word. And you know what? When you're in the army, how many... Uh, Ex-veterans or veterans do we have here? Has anybody been in the army here? You know, what are you expected to do with the drill sergeant? Fight with him when he tells you to jump or to get down and, and do some push-ups? How many of you when, that were in boot training or boot camp did that? You said, no, Sarge! <laughs> yeah, try doing that. You see if it happens. You're expected what? You're expected to do, he said, dig a, a hole here three feet down and then you dig it and then you come back and say, sir, I did it. Now fill it. <laughs> no, you fill it. <laughs> no, no, if you, if you are in the army, you what? Or the military, you obey. That's what the Lord, that's what this word means here towards the Lord. He's my master. He's my Lord. And, and if I'm going to obey Him, this pleases Him. And then He starts, I become, I'm getting closer and closer to the Lord. And then He tells me things that He won't, they wouldn't tell anybody else. You know that some people are blessed because they are such close friends to Jesus. They're saved, but they don't take advantage of becoming closer to the Lord. By how? By what? Obedience. When you obey the Lord, when you are faithful to God, He brings you in, He brings you in, He brings you in, He brings... You mean the Lord has favorites? No, He loves all His children. But He gives those that obey Him, what? More opportunity. He tells them things that others... It's not because He doesn't want to tell every Christian. It's because you don't want more of Jesus. You can have as much as you want of Christ. You can have, you can have so much of Him if you want. Really? Yes. But you don't want to. Wow. It's not the Lord. 
that doesn't want to be close to you. It's us that don't allow the Lord to be close to us. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read the Bible. I don't have time to go to church. I don't have time to serve God some way uh, in His name. And, and, and that's why, uh, we, you know, how you have casual friends. Hey, hey, how's it going? And then you have closer friends. And then you have what? Intimate friends, right? How many of you have very, 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 very close friends? Yeah. Friends, real close friends. You do, and I do too. But the Lord wants us to be very close to Him. You know that Abraham was called a friend of, of God? Do you know that? James says that. James, the book of James says that um, Abraham, you know, was what? A friend of God? Man, that's a beautiful title. What would you put on your tombstone? Oscar was what? A friend of God. How did he obtain that? How did he acquire that? Because he allowed God, you know, to be so close. He was obedient. He was the father of the faith, we call him. He obeyed God. He followed God. He loved God. You can love God as much as you want. He won't hold back. Uh, no, no, loving God too much is, is too much. <laughs> what do you think the great commandment is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I want to ask you to stand with me as we are dismissed. I got my shorts. I got my t-shirt. I got my tennies. I'm going to go have some fun. I'm going to go and laugh. I'm going to go and eat. I'm going to go and have a good time at the park. Why? Because we can go to church, but isn't it time to be the church? <laughs> Why can't I be the church out there at the park or out there, uh, you know, at, uh, out there at work or out there? I can be the church out there, not just here, but I could be the church out there obeying the Lord and showing people how you can be a friend to God and how you can laugh and have fun in Christ and not be taking drugs, not getting drunk with alcohol, not cussing left and right, but in a good environment. And you know what? Everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome to this church. Do you have any friends that need Jesus? No, that's, that's why I'm staying away from them. You know, because... No, no, we should have friends that need Jesus. Friends that have problems in their lives. Pro pro that are struggling in their lives. Everybody is welcome in this church. Oh, I thought it was only people that carried a Bible and only looked, smelled good, looked good. And no, everybody can come to this church. Prostitutes, uh, uh, homeless people, individuals that are struggling should be filling our church. Because when they come here, they can sense the real friendliness in this church for the glory of God. I'm going to ask Pastor Osvaldo to come and dismiss us with a word of prayer. But I'm going to ask you to come forward if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Come up, come forward. We want to pray for you. It, it, today you've learned about friendship and you want to have a more intimate, close friendship with Jesus. Come, my brother. Come, my sister. Be a friend of Jesus, will you? Don't wait till you get to heaven and Jesus say, man, all those years you could have been a better friend to me. Why didn't you choose to do that? I was too busy, Lord. I, other things were, uh, you know, I just didn't have time for you. Why don't you come and say, Lord Jesus, I want to pray this morning because I want to be a friend of yours. I want to spend more time in your word, in prayer, in serving others, whatever it might be, and I want to do it today. Come up here, Pastor, and, and I'm going to invite you to come forward. If you uh, want to come forward at this time, you're not obligated, you're not forced, but just start coming. Start coming if you want prayer. Maybe prayer for your family. Maybe prayer for your spouse. 
maybe prayer for a friend. Shouldn't we be, you know, pray, coming and praying for friends? You have any friends that need Jesus? That are struggling? Then why don't you show the Lord that you mean business by coming forward here and, and representing your friend. You're going to intercede for them. You're going to lift them up right now. Just come. The Lord will say, hey, you're a good friend. Just come right now. Anybody want to just come? Just come. We won't uh, insist. We won't take too long. But just come if you feel the Spirit of God, you know, causing you to move. Just come. And the brother will finish here with a word of prayer. Thank you, Pastor. Let's, let's bow our heads in the word of prayer. Father, we thank you because we can call you friend. And only we can call you friend through Jesus Christ who died for our sins, who loved us so much, Lord, that we have become part of this family. And Father, you see each one that is here today that has come forward for prayer. We thank you, Lord, because you are the God that listens to the prayer, to the need of those that are asking at this time. And Father, we just ask that your will would be done and that you would be the God that provides the strength, the direction, and everything that we call upon you for, Lord. And as we dismiss this morning, we pray that your Holy Spirit will go with us. And as we enjoy our time of fellowship together this afternoon, we pray, Lord, that you be with us and help us, Lord, as we go through this day. We thank you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.